Welcome to Bible Training Hour. This is lesson number 11 of Doctrine Survey, Ecclesiology, the Study of the Church. Before we get started, I want to show you something cool. Alexa, I have an idea. Alexa, never mind, it was nothing. All right, back to our lesson. <clears throat> Ecclesiology comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia, if you look in your handout, we should have gotten from the cable this evening, um, is a broad term used of many different um, things, uh, but in the New Testament is specifically applied to the church. Um, it, just kind of the, the broad meaning of it, um, ekklesia can mean an assembly, a legislative body, a gathering, or a congregation. Like I said, uh, both Christ and the apostles and the epistles use it specifically of a specific group of people. And we're going to look at that throughout these notes. Uh, the first two points, um, what is the church and who is the church, are adapted from Pastor Danny's uh, material. It is from actually a sermon he preached uh, called A Faithful Understanding of the Church. And uh, I may try to put information on that in the description. Point number one. What is the church? The church is a certain group of people. The church is not a building, it is not a club, it is not a membership. Um, it is a group of people. Um, it's not governed by a nonprofit with a board of directors, um, just like a, a nonprofit would be. Um, There's a group of people, and we'll see a little bit about how it is connected to Christ. Reference to that is 1 Peter chapter 2. Reference to you're a royal priesthood, a special people. Um, so you can look that up if you'd like. Next, the church is the body of Christ. Okay? Church is the body of Christ. Um, and we see that in both Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1 as well. Ephesians 1 says, um, And he put all things under his feet and gave him who is, excuse me, he put, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Next we see that the church is both local and universal. Now there are groups that deny both sides of this coin. On the one hand you have the Roman Catholic Church who would um, say that there's not really ever a local church. Um, there's only one true big universal church. And by the way while you're knowing terms the term universal um, and the term Catholic are synonymous. If you see the word Catholic with a little c it is probably, well, it depends on how, where you read it. You've got to look at context. But the word Catholic does not always refer to the Roman Catholic system. The word Catholic is just a word that means universal. And if someone says the church Catholic or the Catholic church, um, like I said, depends on their context, they could just be referring to the universal church. Um, because of the prevalence of the Roman Catholic church, oftentimes the term Catholic is used to apply to them. Uh, but just be aware that that word can be used outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, next you have people who deny, uh, so the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church would deny that there are local assemblies that can govern themselves. No, they're all part of one church, the Universal Church. Um, on the other side you have some churches, uh, they're called Landmark Baptist. Um, it's an interesting group of Baptists who believe that our uh, Baptist history, our Baptist roots go all the way back to John the Baptist, um, which really isn't... Um, historically founded at all, um, but they would go to the point of being so independent um, and so focused on their local church that they would um, even deny that there is a universal church. They're very exclusive, um, very protective about whether it be who fills in the pulpit, things like that, um, you know, even to the point where we're saying if you're not a part of their church or a part of a very similar church, then you're not at all part of, you know, Christ's body. Um, the passage there, you can see in Galatians chapter 1, at one point Paul says, um, he's talking about the church as, as a whole. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, um, he says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God. So here Paul's referring to the church as everybody, all those who are saved, the universal church. But then it, later down in verse 22, he says, And I was still unknown in person to the person, or sorry, in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. So here you can see Paul using the term churches to refer to local assemblies. You'll also see also throughout all of the epistles, most all of them, um, that the letter is addressed to 
the church of Ephesus or the churches of Galatia or to the church that is in Rome. So here you also have references to local assemblies or local gatherings of churches. So just be aware throughout scripture, the term church can refer to either a local church or it can refer to the universal church. Um, and we'll be studying mostly about the universal church, but we'll look at some as far as the local church as well. Um, fourth, the church is the work of God by Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and his word. Um, many historians or liberals or even other denominations might even um, admit to the, the church being a human construct or a human creation. Uh, humans decide who are in and who are out. Um, but really that is not the case. The church is a work of God. It is created by God. Those who are inside the true church, the universal church, are only there by placing their faith in Christ and only through Christ can they be connected and become a part of that body. So it's not a human creation, it's not a human construct, but it is a work of God by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. If you hear some extra noises in the room, that's because my uh, son's here playing in his little bouncer, and uh, he's having a good time, but uh, hopefully it doesn't get too fussy. Second point is, who is the church? Who is the church? Point number one is, only believers in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, or is Paul speaking, he's speaking about um, those who are sexually immoral, uh, the greedy swindlers, idolaters. And then he says, he says, don't associate with them. He says, don't even eat with them. But then he says, he, he's actually talking about people who are inside the body. He says that actually, if there's uh, people inside your church who are acting that way, you need to separate yourself from them. But then he says, but we don't judge outsiders. He says in verse 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So you see this differentiation how only those who are believers or only um, those who have trust in Christ are part of the inside. There's an inside and there's an outside. The church is not all-inclusive. All it does not include everybody. Um, there's, there's a select group of people in it. Second, the church is any believer in Jesus Christ. Um, Paul makes the distinction. He says there's not um, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, um, in a couple different places in Scripture. And his point is that your your gender, your ethnicity, your social status does not make a difference in how much a part of the church you are. If you're a human who's trusted in Christ and you have faith in Him, you are just a, just as much amount. Sorry, just as much a part of the church as anyone else would be. Uh, third point is that uh, the church is, includes all believers in Jesus Christ from his ascension to his return. This would be talking about, so we're still talking about the universal church, the true church, the body of Christ. Okay. Um, this is an aspect that sometimes it is easy to forget or sometimes an aspect that it can become too broad. Um, sometimes we just think of the church as being all believers who are alive. But that's not true. Believers who span from one end of history to the other end of history uh, are part of the church. Those who have passed away are part of the church. Those who are yet to be born, who will trust in Christ, will become a part of the church. Um, uh, but furthermore, we also want to be careful of these boundaries. There are some groups and denominations who would stretch this, and they would say that the church is found in the Old Testament. That's pretty hard to support scripturally. Um, they do support it, and they have the reasons for it. Um, I don't think they're scriptural, but uh, we see a pretty clear start to the church um, in Acts chapter 2. Um, you can see kind of the Holy Spirit's role in that. Um, but uh, yes, the church is, does not go all the way back to Abraham. The church doesn't go back to Adam. Um, the church is specifically, um, you know, from Christ to his return between his two advents. And specifically put that, um, his ascension, or sometimes we put the day of Pentecost to his return. Um, fourth is the church is believers as a group. Sometimes we think of the church as people. It is people and it is um, certain people, but it's also sometimes referred collectively as just the church as in everyone together. So you see that um, in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, um, Christ promised to uh, sanctify the church is found in there says in Ephesians 5 25 husbands love your wives as Christ 
loved the church. It almost sounds like a singular uh, person or singular um, thing. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So the church has a unity. It has a collective aspect to it. It is a, it is a whole group. Um, you by yourself are not the church. You watching a sermon online, which is not bad, um, but if, if that is your view of everything that it means to be a church, then um, you can reevaluate that. And, and I understand there are cer- special circumstances and uh, people who cannot gather. Um, so I don't say that without understanding the exceptions out there. But um, for the mindset that believes that, that all it means to be part of a church is listening to a sermon or making sure you pray once in a while means you're a good Christian. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, you're, not a, you're not the church by yourself. You need other people because the church is a group. All right, so there are some good foundational blocks as to the church, um, who it is. There's also more um, that we are not going to go into as to what does the church do, um, what's some of its purpose, its roles, its its jobs. Um, we have some other classes um, that have been taught and will also hopefully be available in the future that you can take um, that go a lot deeper into um, the role of the church and what it is that um, the church does. Um, we're going to go through a different, a uh, couple different, uh, take a little bit of a twist. We're going to go to what is fundamentalism. We're going to go to different terms. Uh, fundamentalism is a movement. It's a historical movement not tied to any denomination. So when someone says I'm a fundamentalist, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are Baptist. Someone says I'm a fundamentalist doesn't necessarily mean they are Presbyterian. Uh, they're very common in both those denominations. Fundamentalism is a non-denominational uh, movement as a reaction against liberalism. Uh, so liberalism, what it did is it came and started downplaying the miraculous. It started saying Jesus Christ wasn't God. Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. Um, Jesus Christ maybe didn't do miracles. Miracles in the Bible are kind of made up. Um, you know, you read the Bible to get in touch spiritually with God, but you don't like it's not all historically accurate. Um, so liberalism began um, uh, creeping into um, well, started in Germany, but then started to creep into churches in America, um, and it would uh, show up in all denominations. It would show up in Lutheranism, shows up in Methodism, shows up in Catholicism, shows up in uh, Baptist circles, it uh, shows up in uh, Presbyterian and Reformed traditions. So all these denominations are being influenced by liberalism, the idea that uh, a downplaying of the miraculous. And so fundamental, fundamentalism is a reaction against those. It was a way for people to differentiate themselves from liberals. Historically, this is what it was, and it was in different movements. You can have a fundamental Lutheran, you could have a fundamental Presbyterian, you could have a fundamental Baptist. Um, but they are very important, and they're very important doctrines, which is why they made a big deal of them. And usually there's about five doctrines associated with fundamentalism. They're called the fundamentals of the Christian faith. You, like, without these, you can't be a Christian, or you can't have uh, anywhere near orthodox doctrine. Number one is inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. A fundamental of faith, you have to believe the Bible was inspired by God, and that it is without error. Second fundamental of the faith is the virgin birth and deity of Christ. The reason we include virgin birth in there is one, because scripture says it, and two, because it's often connected to um, Christ being the son of God. Uh, Those who deny the deity of Christ also usually deny the virgin birth. They believe that um, really Joseph was his biological father. Um, Third is the uh, substitutionary atonement. So those who might believe that Jesus died as a moral example, or he died to... Um, satisfy God's justice system, but not necessarily as a payment, um, just to show that God hates sin. Um, if those who believe that Jesus just died as a martyr, all these are inadequate views of the atonement. Um, we have to believe, if you want to have a gospel that saves you, you have to believe that Christ died for your sins. Okay, um, He died in your place for your sins. That's what it means as a substitute. You deserve to die for your sins, and Christ died. The fourth uh, fundamental of the faith is the bodily resurrection of Christ. And then the fifth is the physical return of Christ. Um, these are a handy list to know. Oftentimes the term fundamentalism is thrown around. Sometimes you might hear it in a sermon. Um, you might hear it somewhere else. Uh, it's 
it doesn't always mean this. Um, people sometimes have hijacked terms. They change the meaning of things. Um, but if you hear this from a, a traditional pastor um, or maybe an older sermon, uh, when they talk about the fundamentals, this is usually what is being referred to, especially if you hear someone talk about it from a uh, more conservative perspective. Uh, another term, another good term to know is uh, evangelicalism. Evangelicalism, you might hear that term a lot. Um, evangelicalism is a very broad term that includes, basically, it, it used to be a little more narrow, but it's come to be very broad. So if you hear evangelical, um, this is kind of what it includes. It is a very broad term that includes any Protestant who believes that faith alone in Christ alone is his and his substitutionary atonement alone is the means of salvation. So basically anyone from the Reformation, Protestants onward, including, um, you know, Baptist groups would be considered evangelical. Um, so it's, it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar term to Protestant groups. So Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic, um, and then the they're, kind, they're not really Protestant groups, but technically Mennonites and Baptists are still fallen evangelical, even though they're not Protestants. Um, a definition from Millard Erickson of evangelicalism is a movement in modern Christianity emphasizing the gospel of forgiveness and regeneration through personal faith in Christ and affirming, affirming orthodox doctrines. So usually it's kind of a way to differentiate yourself from a Catholic. Um, and also other other maybe religions, Jehovah's Witness wouldn't be evangelical, you know, and then other uh, Mormons wouldn't be evangelical. Um, so some of those uh, more cultic uh, beliefs wouldn't fall in there either. So a little more traditional, like I said, you're going to find uh, Lutherans are considered evangelical, Presbyterians, Methodists, um, Baptists, uh, mostly it. You might even have some Catholics who claim to be an evangelical, but um, usually evangelical is a, a term that is uh, just used for um, Protestants. All right, so evangelical, fundamental, fundamentalism, evangelical, some terms you might hear be thrown around. The last one is a Baptist. What does it mean to be a Baptist? We're going to go through the Baptist distinctives. The Baptist Distinctives, this is a list um, created by Dwayne Brown. Um, it's a handy list, and I've used it myself personally because it's built as an acronym of Baptist. As you can see, if you look in your handout, it goes B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S. -T -T and I made those first letters of the words big, so it would be obvious that it says Baptist. Unfortunately, there's a page break right in the middle of it, so it's really hard to read. Bab, turn the page, tists, or ists. So, sorry about that. Um, it makes a nice acronym, but it didn't fit. The page break just didn't work, so um, that's kind of how it's going to be. Um, this list is published by Dwayne Brown. Um, he's the father of the Dean of Faith Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Doug Brown. Um, his brother Dan uh, also is a teacher there, and their dad um, published a book, and he, he built this list. There are other lists that include all of these. This just the arrangement is Dwayne Brown. So he's the, the list is not original to him. Just the arrangement to make the acronym is his. Um, and then I added the definitions unless otherwise noted. Uh, first, uh, first of all, a couple points I want to make about Baptist distinctives. Baptist distinctives are doctrines that Baptists believe in, historically have believed in. So I'm not going to guarantee that every Baptist church you walk into has these doctrines in their doctrinal statement. However, historically, what did it mean when someone said they were Baptist over the last 100, 200, 300 years? These uh, distinguished them from other groups. Now, um, along with these, these aren't the only doctrines Baptists hold to. Ba Baptist uh, would also, uh, at least a conservative Baptist, would always hold to also the fundamentals of the faith, which we just went through. So those are a given. Um, unfortunately, those don't distinguish us from other groups because, like I said, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Reformed, um, and even Catholics, to a certain extent, um, believe in the fundamentals of the faith. So we hold to those, but then what makes us different are the Baptist distinctives. Another note about the Baptist distinctives is other people can hold them, or some of them. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's the fact that Baptists hold all of the Baptist distinctives that makes them distinct. Um, so, for instance, uh, most all of the other Protestants... Um, so especially, you know, Reformed or Presbyterian tradition, at least the conservative traditional ones are going to, <clears throat> are going to hold to the biblical authority, point number one. 
Okay, so that's not a Baptist only doctrine, uh, but holding to all of these would uh, would very much make you uh, Baptist. Um, some groups that are very similar. If you ever hear of a lot of Bible churches in the South, um, the association is called IFCA. There's not Baptist in their name, uh, but for the most part, they hold to Baptistic doctrine. <clears throat> um, one other point I wanted to add before we jump into these is uh, the reason why I labeled them or I put them in the acrostic, the, the B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -S, um, is because it's a great mnemonic device for conversations. There, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a coworker or someone else and they ask, you know, maybe I am able to bring up the subject of religion. They ask me what church I go to, and I say the Baptist church. And I'm like, well, okay, so what's the difference between a Baptist church and a Catholic church? You know, they just want to know. Um, and, like, when I was in high school or, or older, unfortunately, I didn't know. I'm like, I don't know what makes me different. I mean, I know, at least from a Catholics, like, they believe in works, I believe in faith. That's about it. But how? Do, what about a Lutheran? How am I different from a Lutheran? I don't know. The only thing I know is maybe infant baptism. And I don't even know why they practice infant baptism. And I don't, you know. So <clears throat> this list is very helpful because it, just, it, it can help you as a conversation piece of a great mnemonic. Talk to other people. When they ask, you know, what does a Baptist do? How is a Baptist different? You can say, well, historically. So you don't make the caveat that not every Baptist church is going to believe this. Or not every Baptist church is great. There's a lot of churches with Baptists in the name that don't teach good doctrine. Or filled with liberalism. Different things like that. Um, and, uh, anyways, we're going to just go ahead and jump into it. And, uh, like I said, I encourage you to, um, memorize it. All right. Point number one is biblical authority. <clears throat> biblical authority means that the Bible is our only or primary authority. We don't have other, um, <clears throat> we don't have other authorities outside of the Bible, or we don't have any other primary or, um, uh, significant authorities. For instance, the government, our parents, pastors, uh, um, other groups technically have authority over us but they derive that authority from scripture. I obey my parents because God commands it. I obey the government because God commands it. So uh, the Bible is our ultimate or only um, true authority. The reason why we say that is because there are other uh, persuasions that would um, rely on tradition or, um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, experience would be another one. So you have those different uh, traditions, um, persuasions that add to the Bible. They say, or, or even um, church leaders. So some groups have, well, the Pope would be a, an authority alongside the Bible, or tradition is an authority alongside the Bible, or church councils are an authority alongside the Bible, or the church fathers are an authority alongside the Bible. We believe the Bible is our only authority. Second, <clears throat> more specifically, commandment, instruction, and doctrine for the church are derived from the New Testament, especially the epistles. So we're not going to build our doctrine based off of... Um, uh, uh, books like Judges or Job. We can learn about the character of God and we can learn principles and there's definite benefits and edification. But for instance, the commands in Leviticus don't apply to us as a church. So we believe um, as a New Testament church, we get our instruction from the New Testament, specifically the epistles. Um, and a verse for that is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 17. Next point is autonomy of the local church. Uh, autonomy of the local church is that each church under Christ governs itself autonomously. When making decisions about missions, finance, finances, discipline, or church offices, each church can make its own decisions without conferring with a higher board, Episcopal leader, bishop, pope, presbyter, synod, or council. Um, so we don't believe that we need to go higher up to make a decision. We don't have to get approval from our, um, you know, a board of directors or a synod to uh, build a new building. We were able to decide that on, on our own. We don't have to rely on the denominational leadership to choose a pastor for us. Many other denominations function that way where a higher board decides what pastor is going to go where but we believe we can make our own decisions on our own. 
Um, you even see an example of that in Matthew 18. The, the, uh, that passage is a reference to church discipline. And Christ says that when you're gathered together as a church, you have the authority to remove members. So it gives you the, you don't need to ask someone else. You don't need to go above that. Um, you as a church, granted you're still responsible to Christ, um, but each church has the ability to make its own decisions. Uh, letter P, Baptist. Letter P is the priesthood of the believer. Priesthood of the believer is that each person has direct access to God. There is no need of an intermediary. Also, each believer is capable of acting as a priest, such as praying or interceding, so not actually making sacrifices. But each believer is capable of acting as a priest um, for others. So we can have the ability to pray or intercede for others. Um, and we have access to the throne room of God. We can talk to him. That's the biggest area is prayer. Um, we don't have to have a priest to confess. We don't have to have a priest to pray. We don't need to pray to saints to pray to Jesus for us. Um, we can pray directly to God without having to ask a dead saint to pray for us. Um, so, um, see that in, um, first Peter two, nine calls us a, um, royal priesthood. And then, uh, Hebrews 10 also talks about us being a priesthood and having access to God. Uh, next is two ordinances. Ordinances is a term that is not common. Many other denominations, um, I don't know about Lutheranism, but I know Presbyterianism and Catholicism um, would both, I think Lutheranism does too, call them sacraments. Um, and Catholicism has more than two. They have seven. Uh, the reason we call them ordinances is because we believe they've been ordained by Christ. They are commandments. Um, the term sacrament, every person defines it differently. Um, but the best way to think of the term sacrament, and maybe you don't want to use this in a conversation with your Catholic friend or your uh, you know, Reformed friend, but the term sacrament um, usually is, is kind of means there's an extra special um, level of grace or something um, magical about what's going on. Uh, magical is a bit too strong. They don't actually, they wouldn't say magical. Um, but so I'll, I'll give you an example. In communion or the Eucharist, when a Catholic takes the Eucharist, they are physically receiving Christ and they receive grace from eating of the Lord's table. It doesn't matter their spiritual condition. It doesn't matter their heart. That helps. It, it, um, it's a factor. But even if their heart is rotten, just taking the Eucharist on its own uh, gives them grace. It helps them in their standing before God. It helps them have a better relationship with God. Um, so it's it's just the action of doing. It. There's something magical or mystical, something um, in the in the elements itself that that does that. Um, same thing with baptism. Um, a um, Catholic would believe that it removes original sin. Um, a Reformed person would believe that it's uh, uh, it's a continuation of circumcision. Baptism, when you baptize your infants, it makes them a part of the community, the church. Um, so it's kind of like their initiation into the church, just like children had initiation into um, initiation into the people of Israel through circumcision. Um, it's, a, it's our sign, so to speak. So we mark people with that sign, even if they're not saved. Um, so what's distinctive about our belief of the ordinances is we don't believe they're magical. We don't believe there's any special grace uh, communicated or conferred when you partake of the ordinances or you obey them. Um, we just believe that they, um, or some people, or even like an extra level of sanctification. Um, we believe that you're sanctified through communion in the sense that you're obeying Christ's command. You're sanctified in the sense that you're communing with other believers and that you're meditating on the gospel, hopefully, um, and meditating on Christ. And in those realms, you're sanctified, but the, the act itself does not sanctify you. And same thing with uh, baptism. It is an act of obedience. It is commanded by Christ. It is a picture of the gospel. It helps point other people to the gospel. It is a proclamation of your belief in the gospel. Um, but the action itself does nothing for you. <clears throat> um, we believe in memorial communion. Uh, communion is a memorial of Christ. And um, we use it as a means of, well, for one, obeying, but then also a meditation of, on Christ. We don't believe there's anything special about the elements. We don't believe that um, 
Christ is spiritually present in the elements. We don't believe that Christ is literally present in the elements. Um, we believe they're actually, the bread and juice are bread and juice. Um, uh, and then also in believer's baptism, we don't believe it removes original sin. We don't believe it's a sign of the covenant. Um, believer's baptism is for believers. That's why we call it believer's baptism. We don't accept infant baptism. Um, only those who have trusted in Christ and, and believe in him uh, may be baptized. And it's a, um, it's a proclamation of your, uh, it's an outward proclamation of your belief in Christ or your commitment to him. Um, some other historical context you even think about, I just want to add this to baptism. Uh, if you think about the, how baptism works, if you think about um, John's baptism, people, John's baptism was called a baptism of repentance. It was a preparation for the Messiah coming. Get your hearts ready, the Messiah is coming. Um, people who were baptized by John were identifying with his message. They were saying, I agree with your message and I want to be a part of this. And so with baptism today, it's different than John's baptism. We have believer's baptism, but it's a, it functions in a similar way. It's, a, um, it's an identification with. I'm identifying with Christ. I'm identifying with the gospel. I'm identifying with what the apostles are teaching. Um, and, so that, and that's continued to this day. Also, infant baptism, there's no support in scripture um, that we can really find. They have to kind of insert uh, those who believe in infant baptism kind of have to insert it into scripture, um, but there's not there's not really any support. In fact, uh, according to Dr. Rathbun, uh, I think it's before even 150 A.D., maybe 200 A.D. There is no support earlier for earlier than that for infant baptism. So for the first 150 years, you really don't see anyone uh, promoting or teaching that you need to baptize your babies. Um, next point: the I. I is individual soul liberty. Each believer is responsible for his own soul. Each believer has the ability to discern scripture and know what is right and wrong. Each believer will give an account for his own actions. Um, so in Acts chapter 17, you have the, the um, believers in Berea were commended over the believers in Thessalonica because when they, were, when they heard the preaching, what they did was instead of just saying, oh, that's right, they took their scriptures and they opened them and they examined the scriptures to see if it was true. Um, Romans chapter 14 says that each person or each believer will give an account to God. And in John chapter 2 says that uh, you have learned, hold on, see if I can, I may have to pull it up. But you have learned to the point that you don't even need teachers. You have the ability to understand on your own. Um, sorry, it's 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 27. With the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as has been taught in you, abide in him. Other churches or denominations would claim that you have to have a priest teach you scriptures. You can't understand it on your own. It's too difficult to understand it on your own. You need someone who has a close connection or who has been conferred or who has well learned in tradition to understand scripture. The truth is, someone who's can under, who can read and who has the spirit of God in them, dwelling in them, then they have the ability to understand scripture. Furthermore, they have the decision, especially in areas that are not explicitly talked about in scripture, um, to determine what is right and wrong, not in the sense that he decides it. You don't get to decide what is right and wrong, um, but you decide in a sense of a, of a conscience. Um, so for an example, um, I'll throw out a hot topic um, if you want. Most people believe... Um, birth control would be an issue that is decided among each family on their own how you want to handle that how are you going to research different means of birth control what that means as far as um, what the bible teaches about life um, so there are different forms um, that act differently on a woman's body than other forms and so um, for those that you think are legitimately okay, you have to make the decision of, is this right or is this wrong? Should I do this? Would this be going against my conscience? Um, and and the, the point of individual soul liberty um, isn't necessarily that you decide right and wrong, but it's that you don't have a church structure defining this is wrong, this is right. So 
uh, this form of birth control is wrong, this form of birth control is wrong, this form of birth control is right, uh, social drinking in these situations are wrong, the, you know, so on and so forth. Um, there are some structures that uh, the, the church would decide that for you or the church leaders would decide that for you. They get to choose what is right and wrong on a certain issue, and that's just how you have to live. You have to take it. We believe that each individual is able to discern those things on his own. Now, a caveat, quick um, side note, is um, church covenants. Oftentimes when you join a church, it has a church covenant, and it has a lot of those things in it. You can't use, you can't drink alcohol. Um, it's oftentimes in a church covenant. Um, uh, there's a... Uh, I'm trying to think of a few others. That's, that's a big one that's oftentimes in church covenants. You're like, well, isn't that the church deciding what I'm going to do? And in a Baptist circle, the answer is no, because a church covenant is voluntary um, commitment to abide by certain standards as you live with a certain community or church family. So when you sign a church covenant, it's not saying the church is deciding what's right and wrong for me in my life. It's a, I'm committing as I join this local assembly to abide by these standards to promote unity or holiness or sanctification. Um, so be careful. Um, I know some people who are harsh on church covenants saying that they're legalistic or it's the church deciding what's right and wrong for you. No, church covenants is, are the voluntary and they are um, you committing to abide by standard um, to promote sanctification. Uh, we're running out of time a little bit, so we'll try to hurry. Um, we have saved membership. Saved membership is that members of local church should all only include saved individuals. Um, I'm going to combine this one with separation of church and state. Um, separation of church and state is although believers are to obey governing authorities, the government does not set the doctrine and practice for the church. Furthermore, the church does not hold civil power over their community. Um, these are historical doctrines that seem less relevant to us today because in America, separation of church and state basically applies to all churches. Um, government doesn't tell the church what to do. The church doesn't tell the government what to do. Pretty simple. Um, the reason why this is such a key doctrine for Baptist is because this was a key area after the Reformation. Um, before the Reformation, the Catholic Church ran everything. Not just um, the churches, they ran the civil governments. Um, if the, the bishop of an area told you as the mayor what to do, you did it. Um, the the churches had power over civil governments. Second, in their membership, the church, because the way the Catholics view the church is that everyone is a part of the Catholic church, okay? Um, at least back then they did. And so everyone in the community is part of your church. So if you have the church of um, Geneva, you know, the Roman Catholic Church of Geneva actually included everybody. Everybody in the town was a part of the church because everybody was a Christian. Okay. So the issue with that is you have a lot of people who are a part of the church who are not actually, um, trusting Christ or have faith in Christ. And that's interesting. The reason, um, kind of another result of that is that, uh, church discipline back then was only, uh, exile or execution because in our view of church discipline, they have to leave the church. Unfortunately, back then, the church was the entire city. So the only way to remove someone from an entire city is exile or execution, which is why that was a very common means of church discipline back then. Um, so saved membership was a problem um, back then. When the reformers reformed the church, they actually didn't remove this issue. Um, so, for instance, you have Calvin in the Church of Geneva. Now they have the Reformed Church in Geneva, and now the entire city is reformed. It's not Catholic anymore, it's reformed. But you have the same issue of people who are part of the Church of Geneva who aren't saved. Um, and so it was a big issue because the church and the state were seen so closely together that the whole city is a part of the church. Um, you know, even the pastor of the church has a lot to say over some of the civil matters of the city, even as far as giving moral instruction, like, uh, or sometimes moral uh, code. Um, so, so it was a big issue that Baptists were starting to separate over. Baptists were like, you guys didn't reform enough. You guys didn't get rid of some of these issues. Like, we can't have, we can't have all these unsaved people in our churches. We can't just say the whole city's part of the church. That's not biblical. Um, which is why Baptists were persecuted. Baptists were persecuted. Reformers were persecuted by the Catholics, but they in turn <laughs> didn't show the same kindness as they wished towards the Baptists and persecuted them. 
um, especially even in the Church of England. The Church of England was a Reformed church, and um, the those who wanted to practice believer's baptism, which the Reformers didn't want to do that. Um, those who wanted to remove unsaved people from their church didn't want to do that. And the Baptists were just like, just let us do church our way and leave us alone. That's all we want. We want to practice what we believe the Bible teaches. We're not asking the whole city to follow. We're just asking that we do it. And they didn't really get that, which is um, why you had a lot of pilgrimages to America and why you have a lot of Baptist um, at the very beginning and founding of America. Um, there is because they fled persecution from actually the reformers. Um, but most specifically the Church of England. So that is uh, saved membership and separation of church and state. That is also why America has such strong separation of church and state is because um, a lot of the original religious ideals in uh, the colonial America was Baptistic and they were running from religious persecution. And they, they came for religious freedom. Um, so that's why separation of church and state is very common in America, but it was not common at all, especially in... Um, you know, the 1600s, 1500s, 1400s in Europe. Finally, as Baptists, we believe there are two offices in the local church. Um, the two offices of a local church given by scripture are pastors and deacons. Um, we see that list, uh, listed out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, we believe that in terms of scripture, uh, the terms pastor, elder, and bishop are used synonymously. A lot of other um, denominations persuasions will separate between pastor elder or bishop or they might combine pastor and bishop and then have elders be separate um, scripture uses them interchangeably um, so it does seem that um, they are all the same person so we just believe there's two offices not three not four there's two pastors and deacons or pastor elder bishop and deacons uh, that's all for today thank you for joining us for our study in ecclesiology and we'll see you again next week